Welcome to the second day of uh, our target validation and genomics and informatics conference. Uh, unfortunately, Dame Sally can't be with us um, this morning because she's uh, gone off to a, a more urgent engagement. Uh, and we uh, were looking for a, a quick, uh, somebody to stand in at the last minute's notice. And luckily we're in December, and so uh, we thought we, in pantomime season we could go for uh, a, fem a, a male dame. So we've invited uh, Lon Carden to come up and give the keynote presentation. Uh, Lon is uh, a senior executive at GSK and has been passionate about the use of genetics in drug discovery for a very long time and I think he will give an excellent uh, and somewhat provocative uh, state of where, where we are today. Thanks, Lon. Um, so, uh, a bit last minute on this, but yesterday I thought was a, a really interesting session to get us started, but I also th thought that um, we, we might have benefited from going backwards a little bit before going forward. That is, uh, you'll see out there, there are various collaborations between, lots of different collaborations between academ academia and, and big pharma. And part of the motivation for those is because people speak different languages and ask different questions. And I don't know if we, I don't know if we really got common ground on that. So if you'll indulge me, I thought we might go backwards a little bit. And and review why we're here in, in the context of target validation, both from a genetics perspective and from a drug discovery perspective. So, so for the first 15 or 20 minutes or something, I may bore half of you at any given time, but it'll be a different half. Okay, so from a, from a really simple, the simplest boring drug discovery Chevron model is that it, the point I would like to make here is it takes a long time to make a medicine. It takes a very long time. We start with what we're talking about here, choosing what we want to drug. Then it takes five or six or seven years, which is why I was asking Edith Hessel yesterday uh, questions about the decision making she takes. Because once she chooses a target, before she even sees that go into man, she's got five or six years. And before she sees it get into patients, you're talking even further. So it's a really, really important decision, the most important decision, the first one, on what we choose to work on to begin with, on targets. And it goes. Um, uh, successively along the way many, many years and, and gets increasingly expensive as you go. So it's actually really cheap to annotate and pick targets and it's very, very expensive to put things into the clinic, which is an, an important point to come back, uh, to come back on. Um, how do we do that? How do we choose targets? How do we choose what to work on? Now, this, is, this was one of the real revelations when I left af academia and into drug discovery is there's a huge spectrum of how people select uh, what they are going to spend the rest of their life on. And in some cases, still today, people read a paper and make up a story. And, and that's, that's really important to know because you don't know if that story's right for six, seven, eight years. And on other occasions, people just follow what's already been done, right? A lot of Me Too, drug ability, it's already been done. I know that if I work on this, at least it's relevant for the indication of interest. And those are the two spectrums. And you might ask, I'm surprised no one has yet, what, who would have a definition of a validated target? Because there is no common definition that I, that I know of for what is a validated target. Possibly, the only one is a target, something that has already uh, had a drug made to it. So that you know, exogenously, you put something in and it modifies uh, a clinical endpoint of, of interest. That's really the only true validation that we have. Everything else is, is gray area in the middle. And in practice, there's this, there's this big spectrum from known mechanisms down to uh, reading papers, a lot of expression data. Houses of cards are built on expression data today, and a lot of animal data, um, which is an important point because there's a view in industry that the animal models are generally pretty poor and not reproducible, and yet we just keep using them because that's all we've got. In fact, one of the real odd things that, that I see sometimes is people can have a beautifully validated target in humans. You know that, putting, that doing something to this target in humans will change the endpoint, and still they go back into the animal models to prove it. Because that's all we've got and that's all we've done. And so there's this real reliance on animal models to inform uh, drug discovery. But about, apart from animal models, things fail in drug discovery for a host of reasons. It's, it's, um, it's really hard, actually. It's a really challenging problem. And it's, I, I raise this, the drug discovery people will know this uh, um, intimately, but not all, not all geneticists do. And still, very, very senior 
uh, powerful geneticists in the world will think that any new gene you discover, that's a drug target. Just go make a drug to that. That's easy. Just go. There are lots and lots of points of failure in drug discovery. Not w targets is one of them, but there are many along the way. And there's no way we'll ever take that down to zero. There's just no way it will. Safety will come up, slings and arrows, um, lots of different chemistry, lots of different reasons. But fundamentally, and the reason we're really here today is because a lot of the things we work on just don't work. That you get all the way to the end, you've gone through that whole pipeline of a decade or more, 12, 13, 14, 15 years, to find out the thing you chose on day one was never going to modify that indication, that endpoint that you're working on. So all of that time, everything, you backloaded the failure all the way to the latest possible stage. And, and there are a, a lot of data sets out there showing about half of the things we work on in phase three, so the most expensive, latest fail, and half of those are due to lack of efficacy. So, so that's, that's really why we're here, is because if we could choose things better today, then in 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years from now, that failure rate should decrease, uh, and then everything gets better, and then we can s spend that money on other things, on novel biology and understanding and improving the, the entire process. Um, you might think with all the technology and all the advances we have that the situation's getting better. It, it's actually getting worse, and it has over time. So the, these, this slide shows, um, I must have a pointer somewhere, uh, phases of development from early uh, stages of development where it's inexpensive to late stages of development, and the, the time axis is on, uh, is on the X here. And the point here is that the, the slope is positive, so it's the attrition rates, the situation's worsening, not getting better um, over time, despite all the advances that we've got in biology and technology. And the cost of this is really, really high, and it's the cost of failure. So you see these numbers around, which are just astronomical. This one um, came out not too long ago. I don't know what the real number that is right here. People could debate on it, but it's a lot of money. Uh, this one was in US dollars, two and a half billion dollars to make a medicine. And the reason those numbers are so high is because you're accounting for all the failures. You have to pay, somebody has to pay for all the things that didn't make it forward and all these late stage failures. So again, if we could somehow reduce that 50% of failure at the late stage, you, you indirectly reduce the cost of those that do make it through. So that's, again, that's, that's the motivation. That's where we are. There's an interesting paradox here. Is this this uh, slide shows the number of studies that go on versus the cost of those studies. So early stage preclinical target evaluation studies, we do lots and lots of those, and they're cheap. So it's okay, it's okay to fail there. We can scan and, and search and have lots of hypotheses, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. Where you don't want to fail is here at the end, where it gets very, very expensive. And, you, and sadly, we still read all too often about multi-hundred million pound failures in phase three that, um, that hopefully we can, we can begin to avoid in the future. That's where it gets really expensive. And the, the interesting part is the choices you make here, in part, dictate the outcomes here, which is why we're, we're here discussing target validation. So what we have at the moment is, uh, I would argue, uh, again, to be slightly provocative, I know there are a number of people really engaged in precision medicine here. I think the current situation, we, we actually have an imprecision uh, medicine situation where we have this, as I mentioned before, the target selection is, is a spectrum of the information we use. We rely on all these models which we know to be poor. Um, the clinical trials where we really want to intervene often are not the most, we can talk about this another time, but not the easiest place to intervene. The early stage trials are really small. In fact, the earliest ones aren't even in patients. So how are you going to do precision medicine really there? By the time you get to phase three where your sample sizes are larger, your hypothesis confirming there. You don't want to go exploring at that stage because you're spending hundreds of millions of pounds. So the trials are actually a really hard place to intervene here on precision medicine. And that's why you, there are all these initiatives beginning to emerge on to, to try and rectify that situation from an imprecise uh, and non-stratified medicine perspective to one um, that's actually more suited to the data and the needs of the future. And I should say, just to remind myself here, al almost everything I'm saying, maybe everything today, is is outside oncology. 
So oncology is taking this in a different way. And you heard some of that from many Pangalos yesterday. It's, it's le really leading the way in a different way that is more stratified medicine. It is genetically based. It is, there are biomarkers from the earlier, earliest stage. But outside of oncology, it's, it's arguable that we don't have many, many examples at all of that. Um, so one could ask why, and, and that's a fun discussion to have. So it's a really, this is a clumsy slide, but, but I think it illustrates a point that I was trying to make before. If you think of the drug discovery process here as one where the, maybe the height of these bars are the number of studies you, that are ongoing, okay, and, and maybe the, the width is, is time it takes to do, or time spent in that level of process. What we have, really crudely, is a situation where at every step of drug discovery, you can think of it in discrete steps, from choosing a target, to doing your chemistry, to getting a molecule, to getting it into man, and so on. You lose about half about every, tar about every step of the way. It, it varies, but every time you make a decision, half of what you had before fails. Okay, and that's just where, that's, it's clumsy, but it's a, it's a way to think about the problem, and that's just the way it is. And again, this is inexpensive here, and this is really expensive here, so, so it's okay to have lots of failure here. I think where we want to go is from this model, where about half of everything fails each time, to this model, where you fail a lot here, and you reduce the, the trajectory going forward, so that the things you do take forward have a higher probability of success, less likely to fail, more novel, they make it all the way through, and you spend your money burning and failing at the earliest stage, which, um, which seems obvious when you, when you look at it, but it, it's in fact why we're all here and why we can do the things that, uh, that we're talking about doing with the collaborations that are, that are ongoing in front of us. So that's the, that's the drug discovery, so that half of you can wake up now. That's the drug discovery um, background that I wanted to put into perspective on why are we talking about target validation? Why is it important? It's important because we need it and we can't go on the way we are, and we really shouldn't go on the way we are, given the, the data and the, the results and the technologies we have in front of us. Now let's turn to the genetics side a little bit. So for those of you that have gray hair like me, you'll remember it wasn't all that long ago when, when we thought this way. And I, I threw this up uh, for a few reasons that we'll come back to, one least, least of which, not least of which, is um, recalling that the earliest studies, we'll come back to this, relied on recombination to map everything. Recombination has been the cornerstone of, of human genetics, of disease mapping for forever, uh, from monogenics right through to linkage to equilibrium and GWAS and everything else today. I wanna, I wanna come back to that. But, but these were the drug targets of yesterday, is getting them out of this, or they are some of the drug targets of yesterday. And then what happened, of course, is we had GWAS come out in 2005, 2006, and GWAS came out, and, and GWAS gave more G, GWAS, and now we have you know, meta-analysis GWAS, super GWAS, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, a, it's more than a cottage industry. It is an industry um, of uh, bringing things together, and the, the findings of decreasing effect size, but um, ever so robust still today, uh, continue uh, apace so that we go from um, 2002 uh, with this, this slide that w many of us used to show often that, um, that showed, I think in 2002, we had the lowest bar here were number of genes known. And, there, and you can see on that axis, it, it was less than 10 for common complex diseases. To situations now where you have Mendelian diseases coming out at a pace of about three a week that are being discovered right now with sequencing, and you have GWAS just going through the roof. So, so what's happened is we've gone from a situation for drug targets of not having enough to having too many. And it's, a, it's, and it's happened overnight in a really interesting uh, possible way. So why does this matter? Um, as I started with this, it takes a really long time for drug discovery. And so it's worth reflecting as for the geneticists in the room, as people get really frustrated and say, Genetics has never delivered. We found cystic fibrosis back in, well, what was 1989 was the first, and 1993 was Huntington's disease. Nothing's, a, we, we are only now getting medicines for those. Well, the process takes that long, uh, actually, to get all the way through. So it's only, in GWAS, for all its faults, and we can really have debates on GWAS and positives and negatives on that, we don't know. Yeah, it's too early to know how that's going to work because we haven't given it time to run. So will the targets that have been identified in GWAS really be the targets of tomorrow remains to be seen because that process here has to run its course. Now we did hear some examples yesterday, at least um, one or two for many, where, where 
the uh, time is really being contracted. Now, that's exciting when we can get to that, but that's not the norm, sadly. It still does take a, a lot of time in here. And I can tell you, at GSK, we have ongoing programs that we're still really excited about because we think they're medicine, that are off patent because we've been working on them so long. They've lost everything. Um, but they're still potentially really important medicines, we, and we press on because they're, they're going to tell us something, and they're going to be important for, um, for treatment paradigms. And so um, it is useful to think of, of, of that time frame in the context of where we are today. Now, oncology is breaking the mold there, as I said before. Immunology looks like it's in, in the queue to, uh, to do more there. And we have these poster children like PCSK9 that everyone likes to turn to as just the most beautiful genetic example. But they're not out there in that much of, a, of abundance where we have the, uh, the spectrum of genetic evidence like we have for PCSK9. So where do we start, given that we now have too many targets, having started at not having enough to begin with? Well, there's an old adage that uh, James Black said that the most fruitful basis of drug discovery is to start with an old drug. So that's a, that's a bit obvious. Where do you want to start? We'll start with somebody else already proved that it worked. Um, maybe we can do a little better than, than that, we might hope. I think um, one of the, m I'm biased on this because I got to see it firsthand, but I think one of the most really interesting um, observations and set of analyses was done by Matt Nelson and John Whitaker and others just recently where they put together all the different data sets that you're out there, both genetics and in terms of drug discovery, and tried to ask a really fundamental question, um, do having, does having genetic evidence for a drug target, for a gene, increase the probability that that target will become a drug or that it w the gene will become a drug target. So how important is genetic evidence in the process of drug discovery is the question. And what, what they sh and this is even with dirty GWAS data for all its flaws, right? We don't even know what genes are really in the, underneath those peaks or which ones are causal uh, in GWAS data. And what they showed, what Matt showed, and I think you've got a going to talk about this in, further, uh, in, in much greater detail, so I'll encourage you to talk to him about it. But if you think of Mendelian diseases, they increase your chances of, of success about tenfold or up to tenfold. Okay, that might not be surprising because of the high penetrance and, and the, the causality of those genes. But even dirty GWAS data, somewhere around twofold increased probability of success. Now, that's not surprising to any of you with GWAS because we're, we're used to living in odds ratios of two or far less than two. That's huge for drug discovery. That is doubling the probability of success all the way through to phase three, where your failure rates cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds is, is massive, actually. It's a really important observation that even dirty GWAS data, all else being equal, use the data. Uh, it's going to double, your, your, on average, your, your chances of success. So I think this is really important. And if you ask where to start, you start there. You start with ev evidence that says, at least I know that naturally occurring human genetic variation is relevant to what I'm going to work on down the road. At least I know that. And everything else, then you have failure for other reasons. But that gives you twice the chance to get, uh, to get started. And again, Matt can, um, and we'll talk uh, in detail about that. I think it's really interesting and, and consistent with what one would expect. And we'll come back to this as well. You get lots of failure early on. And those failures that happen early on, like I talked about with targets, that a lot of, less of those are genetically associated or validated because you're looking at a lot of things that aren't. And the, the, the probability, the contribution gets greater as you move later in the pipeline, which is just evidence that showing the genetic association is contributing uh, actually to that success. So r really exciting on genetics. And, um, and that's the a, a interesting set of, um, of analyses from a large set of different data sets. Uh, but AstraZeneca also took their own pipeline a few years ago, a year or two ago, when was this? Last year, and, and said something almost identical, that just looked at the things that, that were still alive in their pipeline or hadn't failed, and you get more of those with genetic evidence than not. Right? So, so I think we could um, debate about the effect size, and we could debate about the data sets, because I think, and Matt will talk about this, they're really challenging to analyze, but I don't think you can debate whether genetic information, even association, just boring association information, increases the probability of turning a gene into a target. That, that I think, is, is not arguable. Everything else is. And that's, that's really important, I think, for those of us that, that have watched the, um, the, the genome un, um, develop over years and years and wonder where this is really going to take us. It has a huge impact on, um, on drug discovery. So you might ask, um, does that save money? 
because we talked about the cost of drug failures. So with some simple extrapolations, we can think, okay, so if incorporating genetic association evidence decreases uh, my attrition rate, so it increases the chance of success, how does that translate in money, in cost savings? And it's kind of interesting. If you, if you look at the world today, if you look at all the targets that are out there, about 15% of them are associated just by chance. Nobody took this, people didn't know this, so there's no, there's no reason proactively why they would have done that, just on average of those things that are being worked on that people know about in pharma, 15%. If you moved that up to half the targets, just half of what we were all working on had association evidence, you'd save about 13% of the overall cost of drugs. Now, okay, just, just moving that needle. So to toss a coin, all things being equal, half of them take GWAS data. So 13% on a $2.5 billion success rate is a lot of money per, per win, per success, just by moving to genetic information. So, so you can translate that into a pharmacoeconomic, a social economic benefit, just by making that choice early on for um, genetically associated or genetically validated targets. So one might argue that, as James Black said, the fr most fruitful basis is to start with an old one, but what we know today, the next best thing is to start with genetic evidence. Uh, and that's a big change for, um, for the, the GWAS that have been uh, lamented so much in the, in the literature that, uh, that even GWAS data are the next best thing we've got for drug discovery. So I always like to tell you, I, I swear I'll stop this at one time, but it's, it's um, I really like to go back to the hype cycle at this stage because, again, those of us that have been around for a long time have, have, have witnessed this. Where genet this, so I thought I invented this, actually. I thought I discovered the hype cycle. I really did, because I think I made this slide back, in, back about the GWAS time. Um, but because this is how genetics worked. It, genetics, w long ago, was a backwater. You go to the American Society of Human Genetics, and nobody was there, and it was all pictures of congenital malformations. And, um, and then we had the Human Genome Project here, get all this hype about what we were going to do with personalized medicine. And then we had all these unreplicated associations for, with everything. Uh, the interest in genetics crashed down to where it wasn't nice to talk about it anymore, and then GWAS came back up, and, and now we are where we are. So that's, that's the hype cycle of genetics, and it's living large, and there's no question it's made this, this inflection, or at least I, I think there is none, and that's what I've just tried to, to show you, that, that it is very well back. Now, now, I said I thought I invented this. Actually, this is... This is a very classic, there are companies that do these hype cycles for just about anything that you want to do. So I, I thought just as a diversion, um, you can make up your own mind for drug discovery. It looks something like this. Um, a, a fun game is, to, is for you to decide where you think things are on the hype cycle. One of my favorites is gene editing. I really want to know where this is going to go. Is it going to be the one to skip the hype cycle? I don't know, but monoclonal antibodies went down that way. Cell and gene therapy went down that way. Genetics has gone down that way. Uh, how do you break this cycle? Um, you, you might ask, how do you know where you are on the, on the hype cycle as, as a discipline? And because uh, this is what people ask when you, oh, are we down here? Are we up here? Well, the best evidence that I saw, someone just sent, someone sent me a couple of months ago or something, is um, this is Al Nylum, and it's the share price of a, of a small biotech. And the share price looks like the hype cycle. So, um, so, so, so they've come out the back end, and actually oligos and antisense, uh, siRNA, are out the back end of, uh, of the hype cycle. So it's, anyway, it's, it's uh, rather interesting on genetics and genomics. So you might think I'm standing up here banging the drum for GWAS and saying, oh, everything is fantastic now and, and we've, we've succeeded. But I think it's really important to note that this is really just the starting point for us. So the catalog of GWAS is not enough. And we have lots, we have all these drug targets now that, that we talked about before, from too few to too many. We've got lots and lots of things we could work on. But th th it's really important to know, and at least from this talk, uh, a really important take home message is that not every gene is a drug target, and not every target is a gene. So some genes become, can become drug targets, but they're not all. You, there's so much one needs to know about where they live in the pathway, whether they're druggable. Um, whether it's really the gene or whether it's code, um, regulatory, not everything can immediately become a drug or a drug target. And, and as I said at the beginning, a, a lot of people don't understand this and think anything, any gene we've got, one of my favorites thus far, for example, like PCSK9 is NAV1.7 for pain, beautiful genetics behind it, really hard to drug, 
Right? Maybe people will get there. There may, may, may be people in this room that have great progress on that. I, I really hope so, but hard to drug, but, uh, but a, a beautiful gene. Um, so, so the GWAS catalog is, is a really good, I've tried to argue, is a really good starting place, but it's not enough. And for the sequence lovers out there, it, this isn't just a sequencing problem. Uh, so many people want to say, oh, it's just NGS, we'll just sequence more and more and more. That's not going to crack this problem. It doesn't turn genes into targets. It does other things, but that's not, uh, it's not a sequencing problem alone. Um, and, and another point that makes this problem even more complex, I think Jeff may have done this paper and, and others, but um, is the fact that we're seeing, as the data are coming out, what we're seeing is that the loci that we're finding are not only tissue specific, but they're really pleiotropic. So they're, it, for common complex diseases, you don't have necessarily a target for psoriasis, because that target may be psoriasis, and it may be um, ankylosing spondylitis, it may be, it's, it's it got a whole bunch of potential indications out there. So you can't look at them really in a vacuum, which we'll come back to in, in a moment. Um, and, I, and a point I would really like to make, and if you bear with me for a moment, just to show the complexity that we're starting to get is my favorite recent example. It's not the first one, um, but it's a really good example, and probably everybody's read it here. Um, but it's this uh, FTO story from, um, uh, from Manolis Kellis recently that came out in, wherever it came out, in New England Journal, JAMA. Um, and if you go back, uh, I want to set up this story to show the complexity of why GWAS is not enough. When we started GWAS, you got, it's kind of easy to characterize the types of findings that you get out of those are those that span some large region with lots of genes in them, those that span regions with no genes in them at all, and the Goldilocks that are just right. You kind of get one locus under the, under the peak of GWAS, and um, so the presumption is it's probably that one. That's the gene, we're gonna, that's, the gene that's, caught, that's, uh, that's driving the association that we're seeing. And um, FTO, which is a, a fun discussion as, as well, which was, as my, Mark will remember this, I think it was, I think it was FTSO when uh, it was initially discovered. Uh, it was fused toe uh, syndrome, rapidly renamed to FTO because we... Yeah, so, so, so we, we can't have genes for obesity called fatso. So we immediately renamed them to FTO. This is true. Uh, this is exactly how it happened. So the discovery came out, uh-oh, that's called fatso. Really, it's FTO. Um, so so, so that's, how it, that's how it came out. And um, FTO was one of those uh, perfect ones, because it's really the only gene under the, under the peak there. And so you got to think that that's the right one, and, and it has lived on that way. And as far as I can tell, um, Nature Geneti Genetics made an industry out of this uh, over the following 10 years or so. Uh, those are all Nature Genetics papers replicating FTO. Um, and what came up out of it, you put all those things together, and this, the association, the level of association for FTO is just, it's, it's a stonker, it's hugely significant. There's no question FTO is really strongly associated. It's one of those in the early GWAS that just absolutely has stood the test of time. And no question about it, lots and lots of, of studies. Now, Manolis Kellis took this on, and um, others could probably describe this work much better, and, and it might be fun to discuss uh, further, but, but really took it on further to try and understand if FTO is that locus, and dove into tissue specificity, understanding what is regulating what in terms of an um, enhancer promoter type model, and, and actually, what comes out of that um, is you've got recombination, our old friend recombination, um, back from, that we used in monogenics. This is a beautiful one. Where else would you go? Recombination absolutely brackets FTO, right? It is, it is in between recombination hotspots. In monogenic sense, we would have just locked in on that. In fact, that's where positional cloning, you only would have gone uh, into that region. And that's what FTO has pointed to. But what Manolis did is by looking at all these different data types, actually pointed out that said, it's not, we don't know for sure that FTO is not involved, but actually these other genes here, IRX3, IRX5, may well be the culprits. Miles, well, in recombination space, miles away. And I think that's really, really important. And again, it's not the first example, I'm sure it won't be the last, but these guys do not live in that recombination, within that recombination hotspot at all. And it's obvious, um, to anyone who can see this picture. So the association's real, but the gene may not be. And from a drug target perspective, it's kind of important to know that. 
uh, because if you want to go do the next thing, there's a nice database out there called clintrials.gov. And if you look at clintrials.gov for FTO, you got 12 studies of things that are going on searching for the wrong gene, um, maybe the wrong gene uh, in this region. So th that's where GWAS can take you, and that can, that can absolutely be uh, a situation where even though we know all the evidence being equal, that's the right place to go, that could be a real challenge uh, in leading us in an inappropriate direction, a potentially inappropriate direction. I don't want to overstate that. Um, so, so I want to conclude with, a, with uh, a, a final example or a little thread here. Um, it seems to me that the targets, what we've seen here, is we've got all this genetic evidence, we're now getting um, um, chromatin profiling and regulation really uh, showing us uh, the complexity of the genome. We've got all this tissue specificity that's really becoming important. We heard a little bit about challenges yesterday, a really nice talk from Fiona, I don't know if she's still here, on the IPS and, and what tissues and cells to work with. Um, my question is, how do you do, with all that complexity, how do you do dr drug discovery without promiscuous collaboration? It's just too compl complex to take on one at a time. I think it absolutely calls out um, for collaboration. And, and a, a further point to sort of show this is, um, I'd like to come back to, is, is drug discovery and what we choose to work on. So we'll get back to this, co um, this collaboration in a moment. But a few years ago, uh, Philippe Sanso and Pankaj Agarwal, also at uh, GSK, took on this question. A lot of people think, when you talk to pharma people, that we're all working on the same thing right, because we don't have any creativity and uh, we, we have no, no innovation to love one another. And so people always say, well, you're all, you're all doing the same thing anyway. If I, if I go talk to GSK, I'll have the same conversation if I go talk to someone else. And so, um, so they took this question on, is that true? Are we all working on the same thing? And it, it's, it's, uh, it is kind of true. So 42% of all drug targets are worked on by only one company, but the majority actually are being worked on by more than one. So there is something to this sort of um, lemmings, as, as I was calling it, um, this following uh, of whatever people want to work on. It's kind of, I think that's really interesting. But it's even more interesting if you break it down into um, proven targets, me too's, dr targets that have already been drugged, so where you know it's going to work, versus those that haven't been. So, so early discovery, think of, versus those that are absolutely locked in. So things that are already proven to work, it's a, it's a, a lemming situation can completely. Everybody's working on the same thing, right? But if you look at the stuff that hasn't been proven yet, f more than half of them are worked on only by one company. So there's a ton of innovation and uh, creativity and attempt to work on unique things out there going on amongst pharma. Um, they're just going on before that they're proven. And in fact, the sad part is most of this early stuff fails. So yes, we have creativity. We go work on things that are unique to us, but most of it fails. And the things that don't fail tend to <laughs> are the ones that tend to have this genetic evidence back, uh, as we said again. So, um, so there are, there are, we do have willingness to take on things, but we choose the wrong things to work on uh, individually. So it's all coming back to, I think, the need for collaboration around around targets to to foster this, uh, to get behind all this complexity that we have. And I think the timing, personally, I think the timing is, is perfect for this, such that we have the need, because we have all these findings coming through GWAS and ENCODE and everything else, so we have all these, these technology and finding breakthroughs. We've, we know the animal models are poor, and we're, we're beginning to get willing to get rid of them. We have this challenge, as I started with, a, a need, because we have a, a lack of efficacy. And at least we're coming to terms with the intellectual property situation. I think we can all ag agree on that, that it's less the case anymore about people trying to patent genes. And, uh, and um, Mena yesterday talked about the, the late 1990s of people just submitting huge uh, patent filings. I remember the um, Insight, I think it was. I shouldn't call them out. But um, back about that time that they would say the, the limitation on the number of patents they would file it's in some period of time, monthly or something, it was limited only by the size of a FedEx box. That's how many they would put. Everything was patented that you could get your hands on. And, and that's changed now, actually. So you don't get that amongst most people. There isn't a view that, oh, well, we're going we're gonna to protect this because we think that gene is ours. That's important to note here because what it means is we can work together. 
and it means you can work across therapy areas, and it means you can work across groups, because you don't have to compartmentalize to say, that postdoc's working on that target, and they can't talk to this postdoc over here because the, the, the company is protecting that one versus that. It actually changes the entire landscape, because now we can work completely elbow to elbow, arm in arm, without worrying about that. And you compete, and you, um, you, you have the commercialization side come in after that point. Uh, which, is, which is changing the model. And I think at GSK, we're really trying to, to foster that and take advantage of it. We, we believe that's, that is the way forward. And you know, there's a, I'll give a shameless plug here for um, the Center for Therapeutic Target Validation that's been mentioned a, a few times, and there's some, there was a, a demo on yesterday. The, the idea here really, um, if I may conclude just on, on this one, was um, a discussion, I think, maybe uh, you and will remember, I don't know, two years ago now or something, um, between GSK, Mike Stratton, Janet, and you and uh, at EBI, and it was just describing all the things I've just said today about failure, about intellectual property, about animal models, and so on. Wouldn't it be useful to have some environment whereby you have a bunch of people from different companies, thinking of different projects, working with academics who didn't otherwise know really how to do drug discovery or what kind of things go on in that, and everybody learns from the other side, and the targets become better annotated, the people get more breadth in their expertise. That's what we were trying to foster here, is just get all, let all flowers bloom and, c and come right together and see what we can do to enhance the targets and uh, enhance the next generation of people looking at those targets. That's exactly the, and nothing more than that. No intellectual property to drive out of that. Everything's open. People can have lab talks. Everything can be shared. And, and in fact, it, uh, this is how we're doing it now at, uh, at GSK, is thinking of CTTV as one model. We've got others with John Stamm, who's floating around here s somewhere um, on, uh, on gene regulation. Maybe others will come up. Why not take every approach you possibly can? As a, as a pharma company, that would be the rational thing to do, is you, you collaborate and you partner with whomever you can in order to get the expertise and, and, uh, and foster the research that you... Uh, that you feel you need, and you compete on deciding what you want to prioritize, how you take that forward, and the downstream effects. And that's where I think the, the future is of this field, and uh, really excited here to have this, this opportunity to, to talk about it. So I'll conclude there and, and just remind you, this is, why we, this is why we're here to talk about target validation, because at the end of the day, really, target validation is a team sport, and I think it needs all the players that are sitting in this room. Thank you. I don't know uh, if we have questions or we move on. Uh, you might anticipate this, this point, but uh, I'd like to challenge your comments that you made at several points about the valid validity of animal models. Hmm. Um, and uh, maybe the animal models are in a different hype cycle uh, at the moment. Um, and in particular, maybe the validity of animal models is uh, our naivety about expecting that we knock out a gene in a mouse and we, we expect it to be yeah. an exact mimic of what's happening in a human. And maybe it's that naivety that needs to be challenged, not the use of the animal models. Yeah. And I know in my particular area, which is deafness, um, everything we know about mechanisms of deafness has come from studying yeah. animals. It's yeah. not come from masses of studies in humans. We know nothing about what's going on in the ear other than from studying animals. So I'd just like to, to, to ask whether you think it's the animal models completely are useless, or do you think that it's the way we uh, look at them and it have too high expectations of them? There's one in every room. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it, it's, a, it's a, you're absolutely right, and it's a, it's a, um, a generalization that I'm saying. I wouldn't say all ma animal models are, are poor. No one could say all animal models. There are, there are many situations where the animal models are known not to give useful information. Do we need another Morris water maze, really, for cognition? Maybe not, right? Um, so sometimes we know those models are not correlated with what, and yet we use them anyway. That's the, that's the point, not that all, all animal models are poor. And in fact, there are great functional assays to, to learn more about the disease once you have a target and you want to explore it further. So, so that's, that's the intent there, but uh, thank you. Lon, can I just thank you, that was fantastic oh, okay. and very helpful. Um, just actually on that point, in, in many ways, of course, and, and as we 
start to find more and more loss of function mutations in the human genome, the need and the ability to iterate back to yeah. animal models is going to be pretty helpful, I, I suspect. The point I perhaps just wanted to draw out again is trying to, you know, as you illustrate the value of using genetics, which is predominantly at this stage looking at the association studies, as a, as a driver for where you're going to get the best return on your mm. but, and then and then you have the FTO st story. So you, you might be you might reasonably interpret that to mean that FTO is going to be the exception rather than the rule, because otherwise you wouldn't see this inflation of benefit of driving that. And are there any features of any of these studies that yeah. allow you to know whether you're more likely to be in a in a direct target position as opposed to yeah. hunting around doing trials for a gene a target that yeah. isn't isn't valid? I don't, I, let's have it open it up for discussion. I don't know that FTO will, who knows yet? I don't know that it is going to be the exception. I think that remains to be, to be seen. How much of the GWAS data is sitting in coding regions right now? Is, is, sitting, is changing uh, coding variants? Mark's going to chime in on this. But no, no, and one of the things that may be yeah. going on, you showed that FTO is the biggest effect for obesity, and I think we may be biased when we actually get these variants of big effect, because they may well be working through multiple factors. Yep. In that region, there's evidence for FTO. Is yep. it good evidence for rp grip one l there's evidence for IRX3 and IRX5, but that's mostly functional. There's no direct yeah. human evidence really implicating IRX3 and IRX5. Yeah. But it could be that they're all involved, and that's why FTO happens to have a big effect is because could be. it's actually worth knowing. multiple pathways. Yeah. Yeah. Worth. But we've seen it before. The, the ENCODE papers showed this as well. Some fraction of them looked like they were pointing long range, 400, 500 KB away. So I don't know. It's a bee in my bonnet personally right now is the, is the, the localization issue behind that. And uh, I, I think when you take it in that context, the fact that Matt was able to say any prediction at all from GWAS is, is pretty important, actually, because you've got it wrong at least some fraction of the time. So um, don't know. Really look forward to seeing that. Lon, it was a brilliant talk, as, as, as usual. Okay. But just a, a, a brief comment. There are animal models that have been successful in the past. For example, renal hypertension was a model, and, 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 <laughs> and, and bacterial infections. But I think as we move forward, there are very few of those animal models that are really helpful. But we now move on to human cells. And I think what's got to realize that there are limitations to doing that, because many cells only really function properly within an, within an organ. Yeah. And I have some doubts, as you know, about whether iPS cells, which of course are human um, cells, yeah. but really have been treated with various reagents to make them um, look like yeah. a, a macrophage or something like yeah. that when they started off as a fibroblast. Yeah. And I am somewhat concerned that we may mislead ourselves by putting too much emphasis on that. But the labs at GSK and, and many academic labs are now pre pretty well full of iPS cells yeah. and not much else. Yeah, I, um, I thought, I, again, I don't know if, if Fiona's here, it's hard to pick out, but I thought that was a brilliant talk yesterday. It does look like there are going to be challenges we need to fully understand about IPS and everything. I was sitting next to Mike at that time and leaned over and, and he said, somebody needs to do those studies, though. We need to do exactly what's being done to find out what's going to translate and what's, what's not under those circumstances. So I think that's really, really important, and I completely agree that it's going to be the cells and the tissues that's in humans that's going to take a lot of this forward. There's a question behind you, I think. Oh, or here, you. So I, maybe this is a question to Matt, uh, but I, you know that these wonderful odds ratios, they are great, and then there's a little tiny, tiny, tiny about the enrichment that genetics gives for drug success. Yeah. Then I have a tiny worry about kind of a confirmation or or ascertainment of, yeah. of you know, that the, the way the drug targets one went, one prosecuted yeah. with more intensity were yeah. the drug targets yeah. that had Mendelian backing yeah. and, and stuff like that. So did you try and unpick any aspect, especially about yeah. when, I mean, the perfect situation is when the genetic evidence arose after the decision to yeah. make the, to, yeah. to use that as a drug target yeah. or to prosecute that as a drug target. That would be a way of controlling this kind of knowledge flow yeah. uh, a little bit better yeah. for this. So, so I, I think if, with, um, if you don't mind, let's take the specific part of that and let Matt answer it during your session, because I think, or John. But, 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 but I would give the, the high level view the way I look at this, Ewan, is I don't know if those odds ratios are, are, are right or wrong. But you, and there are challenges, there are other challenges that you didn't mention, like the databases are really hard to find why things fail. The negative side is hard to get your hands on there because people don't annotate that very well. But I think you put, you put the, all those data and the trends that they point to, you put the AstraZeneca data behind it, there is something, yeah. right? The magnitude of that, I, th I think, it personally, I think is questionable, but there is, the important point for me is there is something there. It's all we've got. 
Uh, John wanted to chime in, I think, to address that. I, I mean, we, we did broadly, I can say a bit more this afternoon. We did look at it. In general, the genetics was discovered after the primitive yeah, development yeah. process, so we don't think <laughs> that's a major source of bias. For both Mendelian and obviously for GWAS. Yeah. GWAS came after these drugs were well into the development pipeline. I mean, that's very reassuring. Mm. There's lots of other things we might worry about. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So looking at the GWAS catalog, there's obviously a huge number of loci, and in some uh, diseases, particularly breast cancer, which we heard about yesterday, there are really good efforts at, you know, nailing the target gene through high C and, and these sort of methods. To what extent do you think the drug companies uh, should be helping with that versus sort of waiting for the academics to do it, or is this something that you're hoping to achieve through things like CCTV? Um, I think. I think we all need to chime in on that, actually. Uh, I, don't th I don't think the drug companies are waiting for the academics. Uh, I think the, the challenge that I, that I personally that, that I see on that is we can't go one at a time. You know, if, we, if it takes, I don't know how long it took Manolis and Co. to do FTO, but if we, if we have to do that for everything in the GWAS, it's, so, so it does speak to the, the need to actually come together on this, ac academic and biotech and big pharma and, and everybody. Um, to. To work through it, so I, I don't know. I think there's probably programs going on in big pharma, and there are probably pro programs going on in academia that are that are separate. But you recognise that it's very different. Um, the work that we do at GSK, we think we, we're out on six standard deviations out on one side. We think all targets are absolutely pre-competitive. We publish them. You can know everything we're working on at any given time. So so we do that in collaboration. We do it here with CTTV. We do it with John Stam. We do it with with whomever, and are happy to talk about it. So. So. Um, Efficacy failures don't necessarily mean it was the wrong target. Yeah. Quite often it could be lack of sufficient engagement. Yeah. I That's wonder uh, two things. Firstly, to what extent you think the wrong <coughs> target is the reason rather than lack of engagement? And probably more importantly, how can we assess what level of engagement we need to reach for a given yeah. target? And is there anything that we can get from the genetic yeah. evidence that would talk to that? Yeah, so it's a, the point he's making is a, is a really good one. Um, I think one of the very first slides I, I had, um, I said 50% of things fail in phase three and 50% of those are due to lack of efficacy. Actually, he's, he's quite rightly saying it may or may not be efficacy. It may be that you, the target was right, you got the dose wrong, you got the engagement wrong, you got the pharmacology wrong. There could be other things going on there and that's absolutely, I don't know how you know, right? At the moment, up to 25% of things could be completely the wrong target or something wrong with modifying that target. We just don't know, except for 25%. I, I don't know if others have views on how you can get to the bottom of that, but we, we have not. Safety failures, yeah. yeah. I, I guess following on from that, uh, the AZ paper showed not just genetic evidence, but having an efficacy biomark as well. And to some degree, mm -hmm. that speaks to target engagement and downstream pharmacology. And the two examples you showed, PCSK9 mm -hmm. and B, BCL11A, yeah. both have something yeah, that you can measure. Yeah. And I think, how do we do a better job of getting from genetics to something measurable yeah. in the clinic? That seems to me to be a a key bottleneck in I the think it's a really good one. I thought about trying to talk about that this morning, the, bio, the whole biomarker point, because it really is, is really, if we want to go personalized medicine, that's, that's, that's going to be a key piece of the puzzle. Um, personally, Sally, I think the way you, you look for bio, per, the way you look for biomarkers is you look for them ideally really early when you choose the target. And if you can't find them there, you look at them really late, like when you already have a drug and it's on the market, but you don't look in the middle. It's too hard. It's too, during clinical, which is where everybody wants to do, is during the course of drug discovery, can I find a biomarker? So this is, how, this is how it works at GSK anyway. People develop a drug, they pick a target, they're doing chemistry, they get a molecule, they're getting it into man. Wouldn't it be nice to stratify that and have a patient see who responds to that? Well, how are you gonna do that? Phase one, you get 10 people, and they're not patients, so you're not gonna really answer it there. Um, phase two, might be a good place to do it, but do you have the sample size? A good place to explore, but if you might be able to do it there. By the time you get to phase three, you're spending a lot of money, and the last thing you want to do is introduce variability at that point. So, so you, that's the hardest place to look to me, it seems to me, during drug discovery. So you do it really early, or just wait until it's on the market and you can get massive sample sizes and, and look at electronic health records or something else. 
So Tim. Yeah, okay, so other question. You haven't talked about patient stratification for the drugs once you've discovered them. Yeah. In other words, can you use information about common alleles or rarer alleles in order to stratify yeah. your patients in an effective way? Yeah. Um, really good question. So that was the, that has been the promise of pharmacogenetics. That was the the part of the hype cycle that took us up in the human genome era. Can we find genes and then stratify patients? To, for safety, that's been, that's been really useful, right? We see the signals are huge. You can absolutely see they're highly penetrant. It looks like. Um, so for pharmacogenetics and safety, for efficacy, less so, so, so far. I don't know that all the best studies have been done, but I don't think it's been, I don't think those genes have lent themselves yet to true patient stratification in a, in a way that you can target um, post hoc drug applications. Yeah. I, oh, I, I, it's a great question. I think that would be an interesting d debate to see who's on what side of that. Do you do the study or do you do, I, per, I think some of the electronic health record information is going to be interesting in that regard. When we can get genetic information on really large samples of individuals, we can look in observationally, get a hint, and then justify spending the money to do that study. Because right now it's pretty tough to, to come up with money course, with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Colin, did you want to chime in on that one? to the experimental models. Um, <laughs> so th th there's a question here, which is, I mean, the fundamental problem is knowing whether a model is fit for purpose, whether it's a cellular model or an animal model. So d how mm -hmm. do we tell whether it replicates the bit of biology that we're really interested yeah. in? And I don't know, maybe knowledge of genetic associations and what the mechanism of those, those association, associations is might at least give us more of a handle yeah. on that. But the, really, the thing that really scares me about some of those papers you put up is that they're not about things not translating from animals to humans. They're about being unable to reproduce something yeah, that's in the literature. Mm -hmm. And it isn't obvious to me that cellular <coughs> assays and the papers that any better. cellular models are, are, are any better. In fact, it looks to me like they're about yeah. the same. Yeah. So there's a real yeah. need to improve the reproducibility yeah. Yeah. of studies first. Yeah. Very good point.